start with just a little bit of context setting um, and have each of our panelists present an overview of um, what they're doing in terms of an initiative to digitally enable um, their organizations. Uh, what are your business goals uh, and how are you trying to address them? Uh, and with that in mind, uh, Roland, I thought I would turn it to you first. Hi, hello everyone. Um, Transport for London, as I'm sure you're familiar with, is London's transport company. Uh, the clue's in the name. And we, we've been on a digital journey for some time, but have perhaps been through the first easy phase of it in that a lot of our uh, kind of standard um, metadata is now available through APIs. So if you want to know where a bus route is or the best cycle route, all that kind of information is there. Uh, we're quite well known for our journey planner. Um, but we don't have a lot of real kind of real-time APIs. The only two examples are to do with buses where you can see when the next bus is going to arrive, which has been very successful and increasingly cycling. But as a larger transport company, wouldn't it be nice if you could figure out when to catch a tube train and have a seat? Or what's the best time of day to drive into London? Or are conditions today unusual and maybe driving's really not going to work for me, so do something else? So we're now starting to work on personalized journey planning and giving people more information and starting to do machine to human, as was mentioned earlier, type. Uh, information delivery uh, and so originally our kind of work was very human driven moving data around through FTP uh, to TFL online who then publish it and increasingly we're now moving into real-time integration and starting to push things out uh, so that's that's the journey we're on um, and still a lot of things to learn I suspect right. thank you, thank you. And Jack, maybe you can tell us a little bit. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm from Weave, and we're a consultancy that uh, helps organizations implement integration solutions. Um, but also, that means we help them with digital transformation. So um, we'd have to think about, well, what do we mean by digital? Um, and really, this is a word that we see coming from the business a lot. And we see this is because the business want to have a different conversation with IT. You know, they. Um, this comes a lot from marketing, it comes from shadow IT, as Asanka mentioned, um, and there's philosophies like the chief digital officer and, and how this might be a threat to the CIO, but we see this as an opportunity. We see this as a way that the business is inviting IT to have a new conversation. Um, and it might be that the business wants to look at customer engagement, their goals might be around mobile first or e-commerce, um, but often it's about process transformation. It's about making their organization more efficient, addressing their legacy systems, um, and these are often the, the core drivers for why they're doing some kind of digital transformation. Um, and for us as IT people to understand um, that that's really what they mean when they're talking about digital, we think is really important. And John, can you tell us a little bit about yours? Hi there. Uh, Ordnance Survey, our Great Britain's national mapping agency. So we've been making maps for over 200 years now. Initially, obviously, paper maps. Uh, but obviously, recently, we've gone to digital, digital mapping and digital data sets. So we've been on, again, we've been on a digital journey for a long time. Uh, it certainly feels like a long time. Um, and the, the business goals are absolutely critical to that sort of digital transformation because that's what we're doing. We're changing the way that we uh, do business. Uh, so I'll give you one kind of concrete example of, of a change. Um, a lot of our business goals are based around customer experience, as has been uh, mentioned many times. Uh, and we're changing the way we're interacting with our customers. Uh, we used to operate a distribution-based model where data, digital data, geospatial data, was pushed out to our customers. Um, but they, did, well, we discussed it with them, and our customers indicated that that wasn't the way they wanted to, uh, to access our data. They wanted to turn that model around. They wanted a consumer-based model. Uh, in other words, they were consuming uh, data from us. So that's quite a big change. Um, for us, and how did we go about that? Uh, well, two steps. The first one was come up with a kind of digital strategy, 
so we had a plan. Uh, and then I'm very pleased to hear uh, Asanka's talk just, just now, which was very interesting, because that's exactly what we did. We built a digital platform. Uh, we, we, w we purposely went out and mixed the technology aspects, which we've been talking about a lot, but also with the process aspects of, of the whole piece. Uh, in other words, the, the governance, the way we built software, the way we operated software, um, and as part of that, um, we kind of the whole piece, the technology piece and also the process piece comes together to give us our, to deliver our digital strategy. So we're using WSO2 at the kind of the delivery end of our sort of digital value chain um, and, and that's worked very well for us. Another point I'll just make uh, while, while I've got the microphone uh, is um, that we realize that our digital platform has tremendous value for us. It is a, an asset that's absolutely critical to our organization and the way we, we operate. And I, I haven't heard that mentioned, but it's important that for your, your digital platform, you treat it as an asset, you invest with it, and you move it forward so that it can deliver your kind of digital goals. And Asaka, from your experience working with customers? So I'll give a short answer because I share a lot of information during my session. So my role basically on this, uh, especially work with uh, uh, senior executives and then build a strategy. And uh, then the strategy we transform into implementation because I'm working with the uh, uh, architecture team uh, global architecture team uh, who's helping and then uh, taking it to the next level and then work closely with the architects and, and the uh, development teams and then implement these uh, uh, different systems uh, and digital enterprises. So that's uh, basically uh, I'm involved in. Um, one of the things that we wanted to explore is the fact that the digital enterprise is focused on the end user experience. And so um, what I'd like to know is how has this affected your approach to um, developing an architecture to support your initiative? Um, and Jack, maybe you can start? Sure. Um, I think a lot of the time um, people think of digital, ex um, digital initiatives as being about websites, about customer experience, about um, end user focus of IT. Um, and that often is the case. But we like to think of this as being about, about the front end generally, the front end of, of what we do in IT. And so this is also about engagement and alignment. And it's about how does IT build its relationship with the business. Um, the, the language the business are using, you know, they've really understood this idea of the API. Um, it's something that's, that's important to them. It's, it, it's a, and what they mean is they want to unlock data. They want to unlock the value of the IT systems, you know. Um, Business users are much more tech savvy now than they were just 10 years ago you know, with the smartphone in the pocket. Everyone understands the idea of the app and they understand that connecting data into their organization is going to make a huge difference. And so, you know, we have ideas like multi channel and omni channel and just in time logistics or customer behavior insight. And, you know, all of this is driven by effective integration, it's all driven by APIs, by by connecting the data and the processes in the organization with the customers. And so even though the focus is on the end user experience, um, there's a lot that needs to happen behind the scenes to unlock this and ensure that this can be effective and that the business can be agile and transform. Um, so we think that's often the impact on the enterprise architecture is the need for it to be far more connected and, um, and established uh, in terms of its domain boundaries and the way it can interact with uh, other parts of the architecture. And uh, Roland, can you? Um, yes, I think f for us, we, we've learned quite a few things along the way. The, the two key ones are that uh, we haven't really been um, making use of the data we have. And the way we got to understand that properly was by actually capturing some of our traffic data uh, from the traffic management system, quarter second resolution, mag uh, 14,000 magnetometers around London streets. Um, it's not something we store or can leverage ourselves, but we collected three months worth, um, put, created a data science hackathon, exposed it to about 200 data scientists. and. The innovation that came from that w was 
absolutely, you know, everyone was surprised and really started to make us think. So we, we've moved from kind of a model where TFL knows what it wants to do and we'll build everything uh, to much more, um, even for the operational technology, that we're going to start making our data more available to others who can then offer us innovation, either the ideas or the solutions, and we'll figure out how to incorporate those. And we think that's a much better way for us to get uh, customer value uh, more quickly, as well as get some surprisingly good ideas. Um, you know, we, I'm working on a program called the Surface Intelligent Transport System, which, which is very much about better use of data. And at the hackathon, we had a, a marine biologist figure out how to identify incidents uh, on the road network. Um, and he was seeing them about an hour ahead of our current kind of incident recognition systems. That, for us as a business case, is worth about a billion pounds, uh, just from that one idea and that one implementation. Not real money, unfortunately, uh, but you know, calculated as economic value to London. Uh, and so, to us, digital is, yes, we need to give better customer information, but it is also, we actually need to work with our community a lot more and stakeholders, and then everything will, will start to improve. Thank you. John? Um, we've identified that uh, customer experience is, is critical to us. It's, it's very important, and we need to foster that mindset uh, inside our organization of instead of kind of looking at things in terms of products and services, instead of looking at it in terms of customer experience, in terms of customer interaction. Um, and I'll highlight one uh, aspect of that. We've kind of made an organizational change uh, and we've adopted user-centered design uh, and we've set up a practice to kind of push out those principles, that expertise around user experience uh, and all the aspects around that. Um, we've set up a kind of an internal uh, group to do that uh, and they have, uh, we use, we very much use multidisciplinary teams and so that group has kind of spread out throughout the organization and throughout the projects and activities that are going on. Um, and that's one way that we're trying to uh, make sure that the entire organization is aware of the kind of the importance of customer experience. Nisanka? Yeah, so the, uh, even in my session, I highlighted the key thing is the customer experience. Consider the customer experience and then uh, start building the stuff. So the top-down uh, approach that I explained during my uh, session, uh, again, uh, with that, like we give the priority for that and then uh, start building the applications as well as even we define the iterations, we can look at what are the most important stuff that we need to provide for the customers and then design that iterations rather than look at it from a technical point of view. That's what we used to do, but we can't do that. I think government, it might be not a challenge, but uh, the private sector is a challenge because the same service might, might be provided by a lot of service providers. So if we don't give a better customer experience, uh, they will move to a different service provider. So keep them, uh, we need to consider that heavily uh, when we are building the platforms. Um. And then we thought it would be good to maybe take a look at, um, you know, from an architectural standpoint, um, you know, thinking about the implementation and what have been some of the most important patterns or approaches to consider in implementing um, the initiative. Um, and John, if you could give us your thoughts. Um, in terms of kind of architectural patterns that we've adopted, I, I don't think it'll come to, as a surprise to most of the people who've been here for a couple of days. Um, and off the top of my head, I'll kind of rattle through these fairly quickly. Um, we obviously are very much cloud first uh, or cloud native. Um, we run private cloud and we also use multiple public clouds. Uh, we have been using some sort of hybrid architectures, um, mainly for sort of data sovereignty issues, but we're kind of moving out into, into public clouds as our, our general direction of travel. At the same time, uh, we have used infrastructure as a service quite heavily, but we're, again, we're moving away and moving up the software stack to sort of platform as a service. Um, and as many people said, we, we utilize APIs as our main integration point. 
and we combine those with delivery through microservice architectures. So again, very heavily microservice architectures. It gives us agility. It allows us to move very quickly and change the architecture uh, when it's needed um, by keeping those kind of single uh, separation of concerns and single functional units. Um, so again, I'm, I've lost my train of thought now, but I'll carry on. Um, so the microservice, we deploy them through containerization. Uh, we have developed our own kind of container platform, uh, and that we use that again as a way of managing all our services. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, I think that, as I say, if you looked around, I mean, one, one of the very important things is we automate almost everything. Uh, we use DevOps very heavily, uh, so we automate our deployments, we automate our uh, our testing, um, and so DevOps is a kind of an important uh, ingredient as well in the agility, and again, I mentioned it before, architectural agility, to be able to respond to change as it, as it, comes, as it comes up from, from customer adoption uh, and from differing business needs. And Roland, uh, what approaches are you taking there at um, TFL? So I think the first thing with TFL um, is that it's a bit of a super tanker, and therefore, to have change, you actually need a real change agenda. So the most noticeable thing that happened there was that the information management department was moved from the usual, we sit under finance, to actually we now sit under customer experience, and a, and a new division called customer communication and technology was um, created, which, which gives you a clue, perhaps, as to how serious we are about this journey. From an architectural perspective, everybody thinks we already do digital, um, but if you look at reality, um, if you took the Olympics, at, at that time it used to take us four hours to report on uh, road conditions, so after, you know, about lunchtime, we could tell you what morning peak was, um, which from a customer experience point of view isn't much help. We're now down to about 15 minutes behind time, so we can tell you that if you sat in traffic, well, you probably sat in traffic. So, so clearly the place we need to get to is to get into predictive and therefore get people aware of what they're going to experience if they're coming in alongside uh, you know, better information integration with car technology so that you can have a, a, dri a smoother driving experience. Uh, you can approach traffic lights and, and they'll be on green because you know that they'll be on green if you're doing 13 miles an hour not 28 miles an hour, if you ever can do 28 miles an hour in London. Um, but you get the idea. So we're, we're going to be publishing quite a wide range of data to different stakeholders in order to improve the, the overall experience. So in terms of how we're approaching that as architectural patterns, it, it is cloud-based. We're, we're just like, I think, most of the panel here. WSO2 is deployed in the cloud, not, it, not in our traditional data center and we're increasingly using auto scaling, et cetera, to, to allow it to grow. Uh, our first projects have been, we did the first one as Waterfall, uh, that gave us a few problems, but that was our kind of project culture. Uh, we've learned from that, so the second one is Agile. Uh, we've been much more successful with that, and engaging the business as the product owner, which again was advice uh, that we've just been given, uh, that's highly successful. You get the business engaged with how much can be built for how much money, they understand what they're getting, and th things are better prioritized. Once we've got our first tranche of these applications live, we then have to move to DevOps, because we want to keep this growing. Um, and so we'll have some new chal challenges there to get DevOps implemented. From a kind of architectural pattern perspective, we're following just the conventional kind of cloud-based SOA integration that you would maybe expect. Thank you. Um, and Asaka, you've got some thoughts on that as well? Yeah, so the uh, patterns-wise, like there are a lot of patterns and there are a lot of uh, useful patterns, so only challenge and 
the uh, advice that I would like to uh, share are basically identify the correct patterns based on the, um, the infrastructure we have as well as uh, how we can apply for that. So that's where like even things like microservices because if we might be excited, okay, we need to build a system uh, using microservices, but they are the business value that we might be providing for, from it will be minimal. So that's where like as architects, uh, we should uh, identify what are the correct patterns and what is practical. Uh, because all these patterns are really useful, like things that I explained, like IoT, uh, microservices, and then basic SOA patterns. And what I want to tell, like even there are new patterns coming into the picture, we should not um, lose the fundamentals. Because if you do uh, SOA fundamentals, and then if you are building a microservices architecture, the changes that you have to do is minimal. So like that, stick to those uh, fundamentals, and then build the architecture. Look at the short-term iterations, but look at the long-term vision, and then pick these uh, different patterns and implement it in an iterative manner. So that, that's, uh, that's the best way to uh, apply these architecture patterns. Yeah. Um, one of the things is we heard on the first day Nigel Fenwick from Gartner talking about how you need to architect your system so that it, it can adapt to these changes in user expectations and technology that is going to affect those user expectations. And so um, with that in mind, I'd like to hear how you've architected your own platform to address that. And Roland, could you? Um, yeah, so public sector, public procurement rules um, makes life fascinating. Um, so it took us about 18 months to buy something. Uh, and many times we ran the risk of just buying an ESB. Uh, and it was pretty hard at various stages to keep it on. We need a, a SOA platform. Um, managed to keep it on track, and, and we did, we've done that successfully. So then the first real project we're doing, uh, which was London Works, which is managing uh, the, uh, the coordination of roadworks, um, it's an existing system today. We have problems with it, so we wanted to bring it into the new platform as a kind of trial alongside um, adding some value to the business. Um, and it has um, something called Eaton, which is a kind of wide area network, standard way of delivering electronic uh, notices. So everybody that's doing roadworks needs a permit, and Eaton deals with the movement of these permits across the industry sector. Um, and originally, we'd planned to rewrite it, because it just looked like it was a simple schema-type message exchange but then we found out there was a lot of spatial operations being enacted as it's loaded. So we took the decision for pragmatic reasons that we needed to reuse the existing Eaton interface, uh, which meant uh, that was currently running on an Oracle app server. So because we didn't just have the ESB and, and a core platform, but we could also then start to use the application server, we could immediately flex the platform to just integrate Eaton into our new application, still running on WSO2, um, their application server, the migration was easy. And I, I think that's the only real thing you can do in, ca in terms of future proofing. I, I think the platform aspect is important. You don't know the challenges you're going to face as you do things, but if you have a platform, there's usually part of that that will solve your problem not necessarily the, the first thing that you come across. Um, the other component we didn't expect to use, which we are now using, is CEP. Um, because we can start to automate, is, are these roadworks conflicting? Uh, and let the system start to do it and assist the users by identifying and sending alerts early. Um, you know, that will pay back quite quickly. Um, again, it just is because we have a platform and not just a small subset of integration technologies. So to me, future-proofing is much more around getting breadth. Uh, good, solid platform, but make sure you've got breadth. Great, and John? Um, yeah, future-proofing is pretty difficult. Uh, as everybody knows, change is inevitable, uh, and I've mentioned it a couple of times. We look for architectural agility. We look f to try and create uh, a platform and systems that can flex uh, and can change. Uh, 
Uh, and then we also put systems in place like the DevOps I mentioned uh, that will allow us to make those changes as needed at very short time scales. The other thing we do is we keep uh, track of what's going on. So we use analytics uh, to try and understand uh, what's happening and predict the changes before they happen, whether that's in terms of customer experience or whether that's in terms of scalability or capacity. Um, so we're, we're looking and predicting, and we're also putting governance in place so that we are continually validating our architecture against our kind of our strategies, our sales strategies, our digital strategies. Uh, and that hopefully gives us as much forewarning as, as can be possible uh, of changes that are coming. Uh, and then hopefully the architectures we've, we've created are able to adjust and deliver that. But having a digital platform that can deliver those customer experiences is, is, is the critical thing. It's, it's our goal. And Jack? Yeah, I found um, Nigel Fenwick from Forrester, I found his uh, talk really interesting. And he was talking about how, um, you know, in the industrial age, we, we focus on processes. And, and now we need to focus on outcomes to, to be more customer experience led. Um, and I think, I think that works very well from the product uh, company point of view. I think within large corporate IT departments, it's a slightly different challenge to, to help a company focus on change. Um, I think a lot of the time within corporate IT, it's about the operating model. It's about how is the IT department structured to enable it to be adaptable to change. Um, and we help companies, um, we're working with the big building um, merchants at the moment to create a new operating model for their integration center of excellence. Um, under one roof in one department, they will design, architect, build, uh, support and maintain solutions. Um, and this enables, this is similar to Asanka's uh, point around the platform team and the project team, um, and putting all of that in one, in, under one roof um, enables this organization to um, be able to focus on quality, to be able to focus on business priorities, implement multiple projects out of one factory, um, one uh, IT delivery factory, um, but it also f enables them to change the solutions they've already implemented because the same team in a DevOps m method are um, supporting and maintaining and developing new solutions. So change within corporate IT is what will enable change within a business. Um, and so these uh, points that John mentioned around Agile and DevOps, we think this is really important and, you know, it's very difficult for big corporate IT departments to move from a very waterfall-based philosophy. It's very easy to think in terms of plans that are step one, step two, step three. You know, big change programs do need to follow a kind of set pattern of um, progress through the change initiative. Um, but within the development side and within the architecture side, how getting that focus on iterative um, uh, change is what makes a huge difference. Um, and it really enables the organizations to, um, to take off bite-sized chunks and, and grow organically and take the best of what they've achieved in each step and move on to the next step and grow um, their experience and, and really change their organization in a manageable way rather than trying to do some kind of mythical big bang change program. Um, so we find this really helps to focus on that center of excellence and, and that organic change from those incubator projects onwards. In the saga? Um, can you repeat the question? I can't remember the question. <laughs> because I was listening to... Uh, all right. Yeah, all, right. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, let's shift gears from technology a little bit um, and talk about the fact that becoming a digital enterprise often requires a shift in the cultural, possibly how the organization is set up. Um, so um, what I'd like to know is what changes have you made within your organizations um, to foster team buy-in for you know, these changes? Um, and Roland, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, it's a um, tough one. Uh, we, we are a very siloed organization, to, so to do a project, we have project delivery, uh, we have stakeholders from the business. Um, we then have two technology parts of the business. We have the information management, who do our traditional hosting, and we also have TFL online. Um, and we're, we're having to try and orchestrate all these teams 
um, to work together while running a kind of core de agile delivery with some technology partners. So the closer we get to needing to um, make London Works live, the more pressure it's creating for uh, IM and, and TFL Online. How are we getting around that? It, it's just communication, it, it really is. Um, nobody actually wants to stop you doing what you're trying to do. Um, and you know, it needs some evangelizing to say this is the new way of working. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the company said we're restructuring in order to uh, offer better customer service. And so it's just, you know, being honest about what you're trying to achieve, uh, asking people for help in a way and saying, can we do this? Can we do that? And uh, sorting through these uh, challenges. Some pla the other thing that surprises me is that places where we expect barriers, um, sometimes they're the most helpful people. Um, security is an example. Um, you know, we, we were expecting a lot of pushback because we've moved from our you know wonderful data center um, into the cloud. And w when we have actually gone and talked to them now, they said, actually, we think this is the right thing to do. Um, and so these are the rules, but we figured all those out because of tfl.gov.uk anyway. So just apply their patterns and not all of a sudden getting these things deployed w was a lot easier. So it's about communication and it's about finding out who's done what before, piecing the jigsaw together to navigate through your particular problem. And, and then you can have some success without too much pain, I feel. Thank you. And Jack, you've got some... Sure, uh, culture change is really difficult, um, basically. Um, and I think back, I look at my history books, as it were, and I look at what um, Tesco did in 1996. So they created Tesco.com as a separate business. Um, and, you know, they knew that it was going to be difficult for them to move their uh, catalogue business online at that time. And this was early days of the internet. Uh, by doing that within their current IT department. Um, so they created a separate department, a separate business um, attached to their, uh, their, their existing business. Um, and that kind of um, bolt-on, or I think Nerdra Fennett called it putting go faster stripes on the organization. Um, but that kind of bolt-on, I think, I think it can work um, if it's part of a wider transformation. Um, and, um, but the danger is that it leads to the negative side of the two-speed IT uh, idea, which, is, which can be that the rest of the IT department gets left behind. Um, and if the, if the change doesn't come through to the rest of the organization, then, um, then the culture will remain stuck where it is and unable to meet the digital challenge. Um, and to Nigel Fenwick's point, they'll become um, prey rather than predators. Um, and so, you know, we like to think of the kind of incubator project and the creating momentum as part of this project as the way to, uh, the way to, to engender change. Um, but of course, communication is really important, as, as Roland said. You know, the um, uh, if constant communication from that small project and outwards is what will enable people <clears throat> that aren't part of the uh, the change project to start to feel the change and to want to be a part of the change. And um, and so it's presentations, it's newsletters, it's it's um, uh, project sites and so forth. But it's also using like a wiki to build all your documentation libraries, being open and transparent and ensuring that the rest of the organization knows um, how the change is being achieved and where you're gonna go next and, and what's gonna happen next. And so, um, you know, that culture um, side of what is done as part of digital transformation is really the most important part. You know, the, the technology can only be successful if the cultural piece is successful. Right. Can, I, can I add a little bit to that? Absolutely, briefly? John. Um, just listening to Jack, that's very relevant for us. We, we created a, a kind of a business unit uh, around digital engineering. Uh, to try and, uh, as an organizational Kickstarter, if you like, for cultural change. Uh, and that's been very successful uh, in that it pulls, it pulls people in, it pulls people into that transformation. Um, we've also, uh, we've had, as I said before, we have a, a digital platform team, which is very useful to maintain that asset. Um, and we've also noticed that the kind of, the Gartner bimodal IT uh, kind of slow, fast, 
uh, system doesn't really work for us. And I'll, I'll just mention that we've kind of been looking into site reliability engineering, which is becoming more popular, uh, as a way of tackling that. So you don't have, uh, as Jack mentioned, part of your IT department left behind kind of in a classic ITIL mode. Great. Um, we have a couple minutes left, and um, I have one more question, but I thought instead, if any of you out there have one or two questions, maybe we could, over here, um, can we get a microphone? Thanks. The question was really around the platform team that's been mentioned a couple of times. John just mentioned it there, but uh, Senka went into great detail in the keynote. In each of your organizations, what does that platform team look like in terms of the actual people and the numbers of people? And is that their day job? Is that their only job? Are they multi-rolled or whatever? What do they actually look like? As transit, yeah. So they usually there are uh, responsibilities to um, uh, the develop the platform, uh, architect the platform, and then um, uh, maintain it, as well as uh, keep on releasing versions of the platform, and then the build the governance around that. So that's their responsibilities, um, and uh, the, uh, uh, they, they will closely work with the project teams, but uh, we should not merge the projects and the platform. So that is one mistake that most of the, um, uh, the, uh, the enterprises are doing, because if you have the same architect representing the project and the platform, they will take decisions biased to the project. So you can't maintain proper governance in the platform level. So that's why we recommend, as well as we see, there's a clear uh, differentiation in between these two teams so they can operate. Uh, they will collaborate, but they will operate and make decisions individually that is valuable for the platform, as well as uh, by looking at from the end user. So that's, that's what we see in, uh, the, uh, with uh, the, the customers that we are working, but I think you can uh, provide your experiences. Yeah. Yeah, so we have um, platform team version one, uh, where so WSO2 are providing our managed service for the integration platform, um, and we're a traditional ITIL type organization. So our product lead is kind of a service delivery manager, and then he's supported by some architects uh, from within TFL alongside uh, some product specialists from WSO2. Um, we think very much that version two of the platform team would be a much more business centric uh, product owner and then we'd look at how we skill those out so the model that was shown earlier probably you know makes a lot of sense and i think would give us better customer engagement so we define um, a bronze silver and a gold operating model and so it's sensible to start with a bronze operating model um, which can bring into your central team architecture and design and governance, and, um, and that can start to bring change about. But depending on whether you're an outsourced organization or you've got your own people, um, if you have your own people, you know, suddenly picking up a bunch of developers and putting them in a new team can be quite a big change to manage in one step. So we kind of make that part of our silver operating model. And even if you're an outsourced organization, um, you, you want to manage that change in manageable steps. So, um, so then you go to your silver operating model and you can put development into, into the center of excellence and start to um, deliver projects out of the center of excellence. Um, and then as you move into the gold operating model, you bring support and you bring the whole DevOps piece in. And we find this is, or in retail terms, you might call it a good, better, best model. And we find that going through that change in stages to bring about the operating model is what makes it easier to, to handle. And, and also, if you go into this initiative from the beginning, knowing that you're going to go through multiple stages, it helps to make it, you get more momentum. It's more of a sustainable initiative, rather than people thinking this is like a one-shot project and then we're done. Um, it helps to kind of say, well, we're going to do this as a roadmap. Um, John? Uh, yeah, we, we use Agile Delivery and structure our platform team pretty much as Asanka has, has outlined. Um, one other kind of technique we use is we have a kind of core team and we have a sort of virtual team. So people are pulled in from other projects. But we do, we do try and keep that separation from project teams to a platform team. Uh, but the flip side is that if you get project teams involved in the platform development, then there's, you're more likely to meet those project requirements. 
Uh, that's just a way of onboarding people uh, and obviously developing the requirements set for the, for the platform. And um, unfortunately, the big red zero saying we're out of time have started uh, flashing in front. Um, but I want to thank our panelists for a really great discussion today. And thank you for hanging in. <laughs> oh, do we have time for one more question? Are we our intrepid uh, panelists? Yes. Hi, just a question for Jack, I believe, because most of the panel there, they represent their own organization, but normally you go and uh, sort of inflict change into your um, potential clients. And I'm interested to know how do you go and you defeat barriers, adoption, and how do you go about creating these centers of excellence? And that's something of interest. So, I'm guessing your question is about kind of where to start, yeah? Where to start? How do you introduce a consultancy? How do you use cross-pollination? How do you uh, empower your own team? And how don't you just uh, go there for a project or a roadmap and leave some bones behind? <laughs> I'll try and answer your question in a couple of minutes. I mean, uh, that's quite a long answer I could give you on that. But, but the most important thing is to get high-level stakeholder buy-in. Um, so, you know, if you try and do a bottom-up initiative without that kind of stakeholder um, uh, momentum, then it's, it's an initiative that will find it difficult to move forward. So the first thing we do is, is work with senior stakeholders, uh, chief operating officers, chief information officers, um, and look at what are their needs and goals. Um, and then we craft a, um, a roadmap that's going to work for that organization. Um, each organization is different, and um, you know, I'd love to have a conversation with you about how to help your organization. Um, I, before I want to make sure I don't cut anyone off. Any other questions? All right. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for a great discussion and for joining us uh, at this very last session of the conference. We really appreciate it.